It is a shot that has never left a chance. It is too powerful to rely on a friendly bounce and charged too full of emotion to leave to the mercy of a fickle rim. Explosion by Chris Webber. It is called the jam, the stuff, the slam, and a host of other vivid names. But most of all, the dunk is basketball's purest shot, its most direct form of self-expression. And in its simple eloquence, it provides a glimpse into the very essence of the game. In the NBA, there are epic battles. There are classic confrontations and rivalries that span the decades. But that's not what this tape's about. This is about dunking. It's about getting the fans out of their seats. It's about having fun. I'm Julius Irving. When I grew up watching the NBA, you'd have maybe two or three jams in a game. The league's changed a lot since then, and so has the dunk. Now guys, wave the ball around. Slam behind their heads in more ways than I care to count. But it all started like this. In the league's earliest days, the game was played primarily below the rim, and the dunk was little more than a novelty. But as the players got bigger, so too did the role of this high percentage shot. But the dunk would become more than just an efficient method of scoring. In the hands of the league's increasingly athletic stars, it became a creative statement. And perhaps no one did more to further its artistic development than Michael Jordan. And gets it away to Jordan. Oh, show time for Mr. Jordan. The Bucks nine to nothing here. Oh, 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 oh. Oh. One bounce dribble now to Jordan. Michael in for the left side, jammed it right over Rollins. Michael Jordan. Oh. oh, oh. Michael Jordan in for the left side. From the moment he entered the league, Jordan set about redefining his trademark shot. And using his awesome skills and a flair for the dramatic, he quickly brought it unprecedented attention. Jordan will hammer. Oh, he did. He lobs for Jordan. Oh. <laughs> Nicknamed Air Jordan, Michael captured fans' imagination with his aerial acrobatics. How quickly he got up in the air and how high. Oh, it floats high into the air. Once he get up there, then he say, well, I don't know if I want to shoot it yet. Maybe I just hang up here for a while, you know, up in the air and just sit back. Look at the air. Look at the hang time. Look at the flying motion. Jordan suspended in air. That's beautiful. Breathtaking. Jordan was thought of as almost a superhero, and the dunk was his magic weapon. Jordan fly. Here he goes! Get it! Ah! <laughs> Makes it look so easy. So easy. I mean, so graceful, like a ballerina. That's ridiculous. That's so good. Yeah, that's ridiculous. <laughs> Together, Jordan and the Dunk became international sensations. And Michael Jordan uh, put style in the game. Uh, he stuck the tongue out, he wore the big shorts. Now every kid in America has done that. And the fans were not the only ones who were taking note. Jordan trying to shake off Starks. Oh, what a move by Jordan! It counts! He's just simply amazing! You watch him, and he do something. Michael Jordan came flying out of the sky! And you'd be like, I wish he could do that again. And sometimes I would just stand there and just, you know, I know he's going to do something crazy, so I just stand there and watch. Jordan drives again. Oh, Jordan! I've seen him do things that you can't even dream about doing. How does he do that? How does he do that? I've seen him go up on one side of the lane, get bumped, still up in the air, twist the ball, do all this in the air. Michael Jordan, at his best, there's very few people on this planet that can do this. You can't do that. 
And as Michael took the dunk to new heights, he also launched a new wave of innovation, as the players who marveled at his exploits would also attempt to emulate them. When Michael came into the league, you could see guys watching him and what an impact he had on them. All of a sudden, everybody wanted to add more creativity to their dunking, to establish their own style. But there's another player who also had a lot to do with adding flair to the dunk, especially open floor jamming, and that's this guy right here. When Elgin Baylor began his career, dunking still belonged primarily to the big men who operated in the paint. But with his speed and athleticism, Elgin added flair to the shot by using the entire court. He literally was that spectacular with those acrobatic moves. I mean, Elgin was the first one that I remember to hang up there for 15 seconds, have some lunch and a cup of coffee, and you know, the defenders would all be back on the ground, and he'd finally decide to shoot the thing. His hang time was incredible. Building on Elgin's success, another supremely talented forward would continue to push the dunk's evolution. Attacking the basket with reckless abandon, Dr. J helped make the slam a marquee attraction. There's no greater player in the open court than Julius Irving, ever. If Dr. J got to the open court and dunked a basketball, it didn't matter what the score was. Everybody in the stands felt that they got their money's worth. They saw the doctor. As Dr. J became one of the NBA's most heralded stars, other players began to adopt his full court style. I mean, I patterned my whole life after him. Matter of fact, when he was going out of the league his last year, you know, I thank him for all the great times he's given me and how I appreciate his talent. Like his mentor, Dominique Wilkins became one of the league's most exciting open floor dunkers. Nicknamed the human highlight film, he displayed a dazzling repertoire of acrobatic moves. When I was younger, I was, especially in the open floor, I thought about always doing something crazy. Be a show. I might win Miller. Look out. Wilkins on the loose. That's freaky. Dunk it backwards. Back to Dominique Jam. In the open floor, I felt like I was in my own world. Showtime. Wilkins, look out. Oh! Great thing about Dominique was every game, during the game at some point, I would say, man, he can't top that one. And then the next game, I'll be saying, man, he can't top that one. He topped his moves every game. He was the first player, in my opinion, to do show dunks in the middle of a one-point game in the fourth quarter because he was that confident. Armed with his supreme belief in himself, Dominique became a constant threat to launch one of his trademark open court assaults. With Dominique on the run, the entire arena knew that a spectacular performance was soon to follow. When you go out and you get the fans and your teammate into it, that automatically make you a showman. And that's the way I play. That's the way I like to play. Is, uh, I like to get out there and give a show. That's what we're there for, to give a show. With his sensational jams, Dominique was able to instantly change a game's momentum. It is a talent that Sean Kemp has also made devastating use of. This guy is like a hurricane. I mean, you can see him coming a mile away. You can see a storm building on the horizon. You feel this breeze before he gets there, and when he gets here, he rain down on you. I mean, it, it is as simple as that. Oh, he went airborne to fight gravity. Lay it down with two hands, baby. What a play. The rain man has struck. Big, strong, and incredibly agile, Kemp uses the court like a runway for his personal air raids. I consider myself an entertainer, and yeah, I do things for the crowd. I'll duck, I'll make a spectacular play, if it's possible, if it's uh, something I can do through the course of the game. Like Elgin, Dr. J, and Dominique before him, Kemp has come to inhabit that special zone that is reserved for the NBA's highest flyers. You really can't put it into words, but what you can do is just say, that little time that you're in the air and you're having that little excitement, you hear, you hear nothing, you hear no fans in the background, uh, there's no officials in a way. Uh, I tell you, it's the best feeling because uh, it's the silence.
The thing about Sean and Dominique is that they can be just as creative in traffic as they can be when they're all alone, ahead of the field, or in the dunk contest. I always felt that I rose to the occasion when I was dunking in a game. Having to be the defender gave me that extra adrenaline. But I'll tell you, when you're all alone in the spotlight, everybody's watching you. It's a different kind of excitement. In 1976, the spotlight was very much on Dr. J as he entered the first dunk contest as a heavy favorite. Facing off against other ABA stars like Artis Gilmore, George Gervin, and David Thompson, Julius reached back for some of his vintage aerial gymnastics, including one of the most memorable dunks in contest history. Special situations, special occasions, um, uh, merited a little drama. You know, you don't have to think that long and that hard about it. You just do it. And that sends everyone really. And the winner, Julius Irving. When the NBA revived the contest in Denver in 1984, it inspired a host of creative jammers to try to match the doctor's artistic ingenuity. Oh, he's pumping his shoes up. Oh, there you go. <laughs> oh, my. That's... In 1992, unheralded Cedric Sabalos used this approach to gain instant notoriety. I really thought I was just going to have a good show and do a couple of good dunks, you know, get a little TV exposure and, and watch somebody else win it. Good bounce. Oh, oh yes. Yeah. I'm surprised. Great move. Great, great. Just started getting a little bit more aggressive. The nervousness went away. And my points were getting pretty high. And I, I snuck in each round. Stirring the crowd with his impressive array of jams, Sabalos made it all the way to the finals where he faced Charlotte Hornet star Larry Johnson. You know, uh, I, was, I was really satisfied. I was like, Phew, this is unbelievable. Nobody's going to believe I took second place in dunk contest. But Cedric had one more dunk left in his bag of tricks. I took my paces off and I called Dan Rawley over to tie me up. Excitement, you can feel it brewing, and everybody got up. I'm not believing this. Blind, here comes Sabalos. Yes! Well, I was hoping it was going to go in. And then I thought, if it does go in, please don't let me bust my head running into the stands. I heard all these cheers and crowd just going crazy. I was just in awe at the moment. The next year, the contest would move to Utah and find a new favorite in a six-foot, four-inch rookie guard. My pick is Harold Miner. Who's your pick, Larry? It's Harold Miner! Miner would not rely on a blindfold, but rather on his explosive leaping ability and thorough knowledge of dunk history. You know, growing up, I mean, I really enjoyed, you know, getting up and, you know, exciting the crowds, you know, with, you know, with my slam dunking. I kind of imitated everything that they did, from Michael to Doc, Connie Hawkins, Dominique, you know, all these guys, you know, these are my heroes. Minor would be challenged by a cast of intimidating veterans, but in the end, it would be the precocious rookie who would emerge victorious. I just went in there trying to focus on, on, on what I had to do, doing what came naturally and uh, getting up, you know, just getting loose and kind of feeding off the, uh, the adrenaline in the, in the crowd. And... New slam dunk king, Miner is Miner. But Miner would only hold the crown for four months when on draft day, another brash rookie staked a claim to it. Like in the slam dunk contest, I guarantee I'm taking I'm telling everybody now. Okay, J.R. Ryder, things will be exciting in Minnesota. <laughs> and as J.R. Ryder entered the league, he seemed more than capable of backing up his boast. I know I'm going to win. You know, me just being able to jump the way I can and, you know, added emotion like that, good things might happen. So I still predict that I'll win. In Ryder's favor was the fact that the 1994 contest would be held in his hometown of Minneapolis. And from the start, it was clear that the crowd was behind him. Well, that brought the crowd to their feet. Now, they are prejudiced, but the All-Stars on the sideline are not necessarily, and they, too, came to their feet. Well, he's got one dunk down. The two that are down, counting this one now, however, have been the most spectacular. The show would belong to Ryder as he dazzled even the toughest critics. Oh, between his legs. How about it? Charles Barkley, what do you think? Oh, my God. That might be the best dunk I've ever seen. I've never, I don't know if I've ever seen a 
never dunked like that before. That was awesome. Joining an illustrious line of champions, Ryder had managed to add his own personal footnote. When I was drafted, I bragged and said I was going to win it, and I backed up what I said. So, you know, I got to love myself for that. <laughs> that crowd has to love you, too. It's amazing to me how well fans remember the dunk contest. I still get people who want to talk to me about when I took off from the foul line. It really seems to touch people emotionally. But I've won dunk contests, I've judged them, and I've watched them as a fan. And I don't think I've ever seen more excitement than I did in Dallas in 1986 with Spud Webb. Long before Spud Webb was even contemplating the NBA, there were little men who found great success using their quickness and their carefully honed skills. The paint, however, was the unquestioned domain of the big men. And it was not until 1986, when Spud traveled to Reunion Arena in Dallas to enter the slam dunk contest, that the smaller player made his impact felt on the history of the dunk. You know, I figured if I got the first one, <laughs> that I had a chance. And, uh, you know, you have to be in your wildest dream to, to think you can beat Dominique. But uh, when you get into those zones where you figure you can't be beat, then, then the focus is, is so high that you go out and believe you can win. Here comes Sputnik. He had never dunked in a practice or in a game up into the dunk contest, so we didn't know he could do it. Spud would open eyes all over the league as he pulled off one of sports' most remarkable upsets. Go out and win that is self-satisfying feeling that, you know, you can cherish for the rest of your life. I think it changed uh, the way we look at smaller guys. Spud's heroics would inspire other little men to follow him, but their path to the rim was still a difficult one. I don't think they got any business running across the lane and things like that. I think you have to let them know that, hey, this is where I live. It would be up to Phoenix Sun point guard Kevin Johnson to make the next bold statement for the smaller player. Every now and then, you got to show them that that's, uh, that's fair game, and sometimes they won't let you enter through the front door. You kind of have to go over them. It's kind of like jumping the fence. Kevin Johnson in at the baseline. Stuffed it, and he had to climb the man mountain to do it. KJ can get up like a, he was like an eight four, and then dunk on anybody. So if you don't watch out this big man, you get dunk. Should be played at high volume. Following KJ's lead, a swarm of little men would now aggressively take to the air. You know, as a guard, you know, you have to find those openings, and, and once you see it, you just have to go. Starts with the step. I love taking it over the top. If a big man is there, that's even more satisfying. <laughs> You don't too often catch a guy that you can dunk on all the time. You know, you really have to pick and choose when. So when you do get the opportunity, I mean, that's the crowd gets into it and, and you're hyped. That's that's a, the ultimate feeling. <laughs> Especially a center, because they hate it. The guy like that, when he dunk on you, you remember first you look at yourself and say, oh my God. I've been CNN, ESPN, TNT, NBC. One assailant Matumbo doesn't have to fear is his teammate Robert Pack. As for the rest of the league, however, Pack has already served notice that they better beware. I'm going to come out and show him that even though I'm short, my, my dunks are going to have a lot of power to him. Oh. And a lot of height. He takes it away. You can't take anything from anyone on the court, um, no matter what size. Um, they are, I must say, way you, you can't back down at all, and I've always been that way. If someone challenged me, it, it, it's on. With his fearless approach, Pack has become one of the league's most devastating dunkers. Pack, all the way! Oh, 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 oh. And as players like Pack recklessly invade the lane, they continue to make a strong statement that the little man will never be earthbound again. Just cut loose and do whatever it takes to get the job done on the court, to get respect, uh, to win, to, uh, you know, to let everybody know that you, know, you, you hit a play. Uh, so, you know, take me lightly.
The little guys are great to watch because their feet get so high off the floor. It really looks like they're flying. But if you want to see someone bring the house down, you got to go with the big guys. They're not interested in taking off on one foot, floating through the air. When they jam on you, you don't stand around and admire it. They are basketball's most earth-shaking force. Powerful men who wield the slam like a sledgehammer. And from the moment they step out on the floor, they seem to be in the grip of a dunking frenzy. It's just like a metamorphosis. Something just takes over. I just have to throw it down hard. I don't know what it is. I can't control it. <laughs> and when it comes to power dunking, Shaquille O'Neal is widely regarded as the state of the art. Driving, backs in left on McDaniel. He missed the shot. O'Neal jams it in. He leaves McDaniel in his wake on the floor. <laughs> he sort of said, well, could you stop that big fella? I don't know if there's a man alive that could have stopped that slam. What a power slam. Beautiful play again. Now you've got a guy who comes in the lane who has force like the Terminator. Fast Scott. O'Neal, solid score. He is ferocious. Skiles fires it low to Shaq. He turns and shoots. No good. Gets his own rebound back and dunks it. He dunked it on Olajuwon. I'm 7-1-3-0-3. And if I can get the dunk 10 out of 10 times, I'm going for the dunk 10 out of 10 times. Oh, what a move by Shaquille O'Neal. And you get the idea he feels he can do whatever he wants. But though Shaq may be today's most celebrated practitioner of the power slam, it first gained popularity in 1959 when Wilt Chamberlain began to overwhelm opposing centers. Just physically, he was bigger, stronger, faster than anyone's ever played. I mean, it's not even close. Once Wilt got anywhere around the basket, it was uh, you, could, you could hurt your head if you happened to be standing underneath the net. Very few centers in that era had much success in keeping him from doing it. Following Wilt's example, other big men adopted his forceful approach, and the NBA began to reverberate with rim-rattling jams. And by the time the league entered the 80s, power players were expected to deliver their signature shot. Chuck Davis told me, he said, well, you spoil these people. If you go in the game, you've got to dunk. If you don't dunk, hey, they're upset. You know, so we just got to get some plays to get you the ball right there where you can do your thing. Away from the ball. Here's Dawkins. Oh, what a muscle ball. Now that was a monster jam. <laughs> but though centers may have brought it into fashion, power dunking is not confined to the pivot. And there's McKeskey open, a good shooter. Not this time, though, and Barkley a rebound. Nine rebounds for Charles, who's had a battle for them all. Here he comes. Just dunk it, just dunk it, just dunk it, just dunk it. That's all you're thinking. Sixers hoping to wear it overtime. Here goes Barkley. He's going right to the hoop. What a play by Barkley. It's, it's exciting because when you go to the hoop, you just got that one thing. You just want to attack it, you know, like your worst enemy. Jazz by four. Stop it. In a hurry. Oh. He put Timmy Kempton in about the second row that time. With players of all description getting into the act, it became clear that attitude, not size, was the key to success. With this stain. I'm into power, you know, dunking on somebody. That's what I'm into. Morning takes it with the left hand. Morning. You know, you're coming down on a fast break and you just rise up over someone and then you dunk it. Robinson. Everybody just is going crazy and you just feel like you say, ah, oh, so good. And as the superstars of today do battle, it is the slam dunk that has become their most decisive weapon. Can't let anyone intimidate you. And everything's yours. You get the ball, I'm, I'm, I'm going to dunk over your head. That was power personified. This is my court, my ball, and my team. I'm going to beat your team. We're going to make your team look bad. Let me tell you one thing about power dunking. When you put that much force behind your jam, one thing you better not do is miss. Otherwise, you're gonna have a lot of people laughing at you. At least that's what they tell me. It is one of sports' most thrilling moments. There is open court ahead and defenders behind. I've seen fans just stand up and, and 
What's, what's it going to do? How is it going to look? The adrenaline rushes. Concentration is complete. And time seems to almost stand still. You're on the fast break and just reach for the, reach for the sky. You are alone leading the fast break. And as you near your goal, there is only one thing on your mind. I'm saying to myself, got to be exciting and he can't miss it. Here comes Shrimp taking off and jamming it. Oh, he missed it! Oh, my. On the lob. Oh, oh, my. oh, my. Quick burst to the hoop. Oh, he missed the jump. There's the lob. Unbelievable! Charles Barkley. He's human. Let's see Hunter steal it. And missed the stop. The wheel off. Scoop to Doherty. Oh, he missed the slam. Jerome Kersey missed the jam. X to D. Whoa! Embarrassing. When you miss a wide open gym, it's the most embarrassing thing in the world. It's like tripping and falling on your face in the middle of rush hour. You, you know that 18,000 fans are watching you in that stadium, let alone the people that are watching on TV. I mean, if you want to really be known as a good player, you don't miss dunks. He's by midcourt. Buckle up, baby! Oh! It either slips or you just miss it. Underneath, and O'Neal misses the slam dunk. I've never seen a player make all of his dunks. Dishing off to Shaquille, he missed the slam. You won't see him do that very often. <laughs> That's probably the loneliest feeling in the world there. Oh, and he That's couldn't finish that one. one. You don't want to uh, deal with that too much. Deep round, slip. No, he missed it! There was one time I had a fast break, and I, you know, I, I put a little bit too much in it, and I just went up, crowd stood up, and just did what I could and hit the front of the rim. He's off to the races. Nobody will catch him. He missed the dunk. I want to quit after that. But perhaps one of the NBA's most memorable miscues came courtesy of Dominique Wilkins during the 1991 All-Star Game in Charlotte. Switches to the left hand. Ricky Pierce in the ball game now from the Bucks. Wilkins, look out. Oh, he blows the dunk. He can't, can't believe, believe it. it. Look at him at the other end. When it's wide open like that, you know, you sort of hold on to your seat. So when he did it, and he missed it, first I was in shock, then I had to laugh at him. Oh, they, oh, they wrote me bad. You know, the intention was good. When I went up, I said, you know, I'm gonna make this dunk. My leg said, no, don't even try it. But it was that, at that time, it was too late to stop the wind up. Actually, it was more fun than that. I had a good time with it. I, I, I laughed. Dominique will tell you that the worst part about that dunk was not that it was on national television. The worst part was having to go into the locker room afterwards. Teammates have no mercy. But it'll also tell you that you have to keep going for it because one dunk can put you on the map for better or worse. Just ask Charles Barkley. At the 1993 NBA draft, Chris Webber was chosen first by the Orlando Magic and prepared himself to play a supporting role to center Shaquille O'Neal. But within minutes, he would be sent 3,000 miles away to Golden State, where he would abruptly be recast as their front court savior and face some immediate concerns. Well, I live up to the expectations of, you know, being a number one pick or, or the money that they're paying me, or, and, it, and it seems overwhelming. But by the season's sixth game, Weber had begun to answer his questions. And facing reigning MVP Charles Barkley, he made a bold statement to the rest of the league. Saved by Ainge, nice fake on Owens. Back to Green, into the hands of Stilwell. Fast break down to Weber, he turns. Look up behind the back, and the step and the foul. What a play by Weber! Well, I saw him coming. I didn't really think he was going to jump. Uh, I really don't think you should jump when a guy you know, has an advantage on you, and I can jump pretty high, and I'm taller than him. So I didn't think he was going to jump. And, um, he jumped, and, and I got him. But I'm sure I'm, you know, somebody will get me one day, so I don't want to make too much of a big deal out of it. Weber's sensational dunk would have farther reaching consequences than even he could imagine. Instantly putting him on the NBA map, it would help propel him to a Rookie of the Year season and be immortalized forever in a national commercial. Yeah, didn't you see Chris uh, dunk on Charles Barkley? Catch it like this, around the back. Oh, Barkley comes so he's to Barkley, trying to block it. Oh, wait, he's too high, he's too high. <laughs> and then what did Barkley say? 
He said, I don't believe in role models, but uh, you mine, man. <laughs> But while Weber rose quickly to stardom, John Starks often seemed like he'd never get there. After putting himself through college by bagging groceries at a supermarket, Starks was left undrafted and relegated to the CBA. He would eventually latch on with the New York Knicks, where his ferocious determination helped him become a starting guard in the NBA. But in 1993, the Knicks would face the Chicago Bulls in the conference finals, where Starks faced the seemingly overwhelming task of matching up with Michael Jordan. We do not have a man on this planet who can stop him, okay? There isn't anyone out here who can stop him. But Starks was ready. It was a test he had prepared all of his life for. Or uh, is he reading MJ real well? He has studied films on Michael Jordan. And with game two hanging in the balance, Starks would announce to Jordan and the world that his time had come. We're down. There are 50 seconds left in the fourth quarter. Starks, yes! What a move by Starks, who was able to sky for the basket. I was coming down uh, right-hand side of the court, and for the second half, they always would jump, you know, on my high side and, and force me baseline. But Cartwright, he was uh, slow to uh, react to a B.J. Armstrong move and my eyes opened and got so big once I seen the lane open and I, and I knew that I was going to take it over the top. Elevation and slam is jamming. Starks with the spark. And all I saw was a, just a, a big explosion up to the basket and a, a great and a tremendous thunderous dunk over Michael and Horace Grant. It was fantastic. Yeah, nasty stuff by Starky. That play should just about finish off the group. I think those first two games uh, announced that I was here and announced that uh, I am a player to be reckoned with. And uh, uh, he, he put a stamp on the game and I think in, uh, a print on everyone else's mind. In that moment, John Starks reached the goal he had worked so long for. He would be recognized as one of the league's top guards and be named to the All-Star team the very next season. The Knicks' trials, however, were far from over. After drafting Patrick Ewing in 1985, they had been expected to reach the finals in short order. But nine years later, they had yet to fulfill this elusive goal. The 1994 season would see them battle their way to the conference finals and face the Indiana Pacers. Fittingly, as they trailed late in the fourth quarter of game seven, New York would look to Ewing. You know, a lot of things was happening. We were shooting a lot of uh, jumpers and we were missing. And I told Pat, so you know, forget it, run my play. <laughs> if we're going to lose, we're going to lose with me. Behind Ewing, the Knicks would proceed to wipe away a 10-point deficit. Well, Patrick Ewing has caught fire. And trailing by one in the waning seconds, it was Ewing who would again answer the call. Starks behind the pick by Ewing. Takes it all the way to the basket, put it up too hard. Ewing follows for the slam. Ewing has been magnificent tonight. All you see in that clip is his arms and his his forearms just about at the rim. I remember seeing it very clearly and him coming down, slamming it through with two hands. Patrick's been here the longest out of everyone. And uh, for him to, you know, dunk the ball through, uh, you know, it's a highlight of his career as well as the highlight for the Knicks. I mean, that's just, that, that's the climax, that hoop right there, because that propelled us into the finals. I've been around pro basketball for a long time now, and I've seen a lot of great dunkers. But the guys coming in now are truly unbelievable. They've seen the jam evolve as they were growing up, and they've all been dreaming about the crazy dunks that they want to do. So when they get their chance in the NBA, they are ready to put on a show. As players grow up, they look up, watching the generations before them and adding their own personal style. And when they follow in the footsteps of their one-time idols, they are ready to push the creative boundaries of their craft. The dunk is what people pay attention to. Uh, you know, I've talked to Julius Erdman, I've talked to Michael Jordan, Dominique, and all those guys. The dunk is the first thing people look at. Now Kemp going to the hoop. Wow! Now that is attacking the basket. That's just what I'm talking about with Sean Kemp. If anybody talk about a younger generation, or anybody talk about what a league is laying on them. 
the shoulders of this younger generation, this guy, this guy. I want to be one of those guys. I like to dunk on people and dunk on them hard and let them know. And I think that's what it's all about. Most of the guys in the league are doing that now, dunking hard on people so they won't jump next time. Ejected coast to coast, Ryder goes up high! So that's what it's all about. <laughs> You're trying to make a statement. Morning drives to his left, <laughs> slams it home, and a foul is called on Houston. Especially to the other team. Good morning along the inline. Oh, man, a man oh. he raises up. And they don't remember Shaq by shooting jumpers. The effect after you do it, that's everything, you know, in terms of getting the, the crowd into it. Oh, my. Hammer time. Oh, my. They call them the New Jacks, and, uh, you know, they, they are back. I mean, they're around, and I think it has elevated the game of basketball. I mean, they more excitement to the game, and this is entertainment, and whether we want to face it or not, if you don't like getting dunked on, well, you shouldn't be playing. And as this electrifying new wave of performers vie for the spotlight, they challenge each other to reach even greater heights. I got skills, you got skills. You know, let's match them. Followed by Johnson. Every time I see him dunk and I'm in competition with him, it just raises me up that much higher. He steals a show if, if, you know, if you let him. So you just got to try to match a guy like that who has unbelievable talent like that. When I play, the, uh, play against top guys, I, adrenaline helps a lot. You jump a little bit higher, it's your ball. Your court, your everything. That's how you should play. Play mean. More than just a simple shot, the dunk is now a statement, a measure of will and determination. Oh, oh let's play. We're underway. What a move right off the bat by You gotta go in there and earn your respect and get your respect, and that's one way of doing it. Start for the Mavericks. Mashburn to finish. And the competition seems to be getting more intense. But that's the main thing. I want to keep driving, just keep practicing, keep learning as much as I can. It's just a matter of continuing to work and, and just getting that opportunity. That was a cloud piercer for my... And as the kids of today marvel at these young stars, they prepare to take the dunk even further in its often breathtaking evolution. I love watching the young guys jam because you never know what they're going to come up with. That's the great thing about dunking. It's all creativity. Each player has his own style, and the guy I'm going to leave you with is the perfect mixture of power and grace. He has it all. He can float. He can throw it down hard. He's just, all right, it's me. Relax and enjoy the rest of the show. From the University of Massachusetts, number six, Captain of the Philadelphia 76ers, Julius the Doctor Irving. Julius picks it up. What goes around will come around. Sounds escape, sublime and climb, defined by the moment of inspiration, creation in motion. Rhythms divide, chords collide, and thoughts fly. We're getting back to basics. Four on three to Irving. We're getting back to basics. Huh. We're getting back to basics. We're getting back to basics. Check out. Talking about a music for the mind, heart, and feet. Complete free expression to communicate, elate, and assimilate with a lyrical rhyme. With time after time, I'm feeling fine, staying in line. I'm getting back to basics. I'm getting back to basics. 
uh-uh, I'm getting back to basics. Jason Williams drives and dunks the mid. Keenan, oh, what a pass to Johnson to Barkley. Power to the hoop. Slam dunk. The mailman. Oh, he got the step. Robert. Down to the five. Harper. Anderson. Straight down the pipe. Mercy. He shot off quickly. Oh!